Good evening. My name is Tamar Meyer, Timmy Meyer as I am known, uh, and I'm the director of the Reuton Center for, the global, for Global Affairs, and I'm the co-organizer -orga with Kat Ashcraft of, the, of this symposium on the politics of fresh water with major, major, major help also from Charlotte Tate. I'm delighted to welcome all of you and particularly the panelists who came from far and from near to be with us in Middlebury. Some people are still stuck. They are on the way. Some people have been traveling already for three days and they still haven't arrived. Uh, so anyway, thank you all for coming. This year's conference marks what we hope will become an annual tradition at Middlebury College. Although, as some of you know, the center has hosted more than a dozen conferences and roundtable symposia in the past decade. From now on, this conference, these conferences will become more interdisciplinary and inclusive. The idea is to have an annual conference on a global theme that can be discussed from multiple disciplinary perspectives and can both contribute to our international and global studies curriculum and connect our campus to CV Star Middlebury schools abroad. To that end, we have invited scholars from the social sciences and from the humanities, as well as policymakers and engineers in the field of water management. Some of the participants hold positions at universities that host our programs abroad. In addition, one of our IGS capstone seminar this spring is on water issues, and I hope that I see, I don't know you, but I'm assuming that a lot of you, raise your hands, who is in that seminar? <laughs> I thought there were 18. How come there are only three here? Uh, they'll come tomorrow maybe? Maybe, okay. Uh, so um, in addition, the, uh, there is one IGS seminar on water issues, and yesterday in this very room, we brought together, we brought students of the Arabic program here from campus together with our students in Amman through a pretty stimulating teleconferencing discussion in Arabic about water issues. And I want to thank Bob Greeley for managing this. Thank you, Bob, who is a geographer, by the way. Um, we chose the politics of fresh water as the theme for the inaugural conference for several reasons. First, because water is the lifeline without which nothing on earth can survive. Second, because water can be a source of identity to both individual and national groups in many parts of the world. Third, because water has now become an economic commodity and a source of political conflict. Fourth, because access to fresh water has now become a global challenge that manifests itself at the local, regional, and national levels with social, political, and cultural ramifications. We are facing a serious water crisis, the likes of which we haven't experienced before, and the severity of which we cannot fully fathom. And fifth, because 2013 has been designated by the United Nations as the International Year for Water Cooperation, that's, one, that's the fifth reason why we chose this topic. We think it is important to discuss not only conflicts over water, but also the successful governance of shared water basins. The current water crisis is about access to fresh water in terms of both quantity and quality. According to the 2012 United Nations figures, 85% of the world's population currently lives on the, on the driest half of the planet. 85%. As world population continues to grow, and this will happen especially in these driest regions, the demand for water will grow accordingly. The additional 2 billion people who are expected to be born in the, in the next three decades will need to be fed. It is predicted that the demand for food will thus increase by more than 50% in the next 25 years, with some estimating 70% increase in demand of food for food by 2050. Meanwhile, the demand for energy 
from hydropower and other renewable sources is expected to increase by more than 50% during the same period. The result will be the supply of water for agricultural uses, whether to feed people or to meet our growing energy needs, will not keep pace with the quantity and quality of available fresh water, as these two sectors will compete with one another. The problem will be exacerbated by continuing urbanization, industrialization, and a corresponding growth in the standard of living in the global south. While the demand for water continues to grow, the supply does not. Climate change and global warming have already resulted in the glaciers and snow caps of the largest freshwater containers in the world melting at a faster pace than ever before, from Kilimanjaro to the greater Himalaya region. As a result of such changes, the availability of fresh water is far less predictable and reliable. There is either too little or too much, either droughts or floods. But the crisis is not only about quantity. It is about quality as well. Figures published by the United Nations show clearly how severe the problem is. More than three quarters of a billion people do not have access to clean water, and almost two and a half billion do not have access to adequate sanitation. In addition, six to eight million people die annually from the consequences of water-related disasters and diseases. Most of these deaths occur in the global south. Access to clean water has been one of the targets of the United Nations 2015 Millennium Development Goals. Yet 2015 is only two years away, and the number of people without reliable access to safe drinking water and basic sanitation is now declining far too slowly to meet the goals. In this report card, we get the grade of F. This conference will address the who, where, when, and why of access to fresh water. We need to answer these questions for every level, from the local to the global, as we need to, and we need to look at the reality and the representation of these issues historically, all the way from Roman times, and not only at the present. It was a desire to answer these questions that led Kat and me to invite this impressive group of scholars represented representing so many different disciplines to, Middlebury, to the Middlebury College campus. We hope that in the next two days we will engage in, a product, in productive discussions about different aspects of the politics of fresh water. Before I invite Professor Sheridan to chair the session and Gillian Rieck to introduce the, speaker tonight, the speakers tonight, I want to thank several people. I want to thank Charlotte Tate and Martha Baldwin as well as well as our students' interns, our students' steering committee, Nico Digolia here, and Greg Woolstone in Amman for their in, in, indispensable help in managing the complex logistics of an international conference. Thank you very much. This event... <laughs> This event is co-sponsored by several programs and departments. Let me list them. The Christian A. Johnson Economics Fund, the CV Star Middlebury Schools Abroad, the Program in Environmental Studies, Franklin Environmental Center at, at Hillcrest, the Departments of English and American Literatures, Classics, Geography, and Political Science, and the Reutin Center for Global Affairs. Let's get the show on the road. Let's begin, and please... You're invited. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Professor Meyer. Welcome again to what will hopefully become the Rohatton Center for Global Affairs Annual Conference. My name is Jillian Loy. I'm a senior environmental studies and conservation biology joint major here at Middlebury College, and I'll be the student chair of tonight's panel. The structure of tonight's panel is quite simple. Um, each of our two presenters will 
give a 15 to 20 minute talk. Um, their talks will be followed by a question and answer session which will be moderated by Professor Michael Sheridan. He's the Associate Professor of Anthropology here at Middlebury College and he's explored irrigation management and water conservation practices through his work with the Peace Corps and through other formal research and field studies. Um, after this question and answer session, each panelist will then have the opportunity to give a short two minute closing remark before tonight's session officially comes to a close. Tonight you all will have the pleasure of hearing from our two presenters, the first of whom is William J. Cosgrove. Um, Make sure that everybody hears you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cosgrove is a senior, oh, senior research scholar at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, project director of the Global Water Scenarios Project, and a member of the Gulbenkian Foundation think tank on water and humanity. He is chair of the board of the Water Economics, Policy, and Governance Research Network in Canada. He is the former vice president of the World Bank and past president of the World Water Council. He served as chairman of the International Steering Committee of the Dialogue on Water and Climate, while his recent publications include The Dynamics of Global Water Futures, Driving Forces 2011 to 2050, World Water Vision, Making Water Everybody's Business, and Water Security and Peace, a synthesis of studies prepared for UNESCO under the PCCP, that's Potential Conflict to Cooperation Potential, Water for Peace Process. Uh, in his talk titled An Equitable and Sustainable Water Future, Mr. Cosgrove will touch upon the ways in which our burgeoning populations are changing the Earth's geophysical and biophysical systems, how water managers are working to meet the growing and diverse needs of our increasing populations, and how collaboration can ultimately lead us on the track to a more sustainable world. The second presenter tonight will be uh, Frank McGilligan. Uh, he is the professor of geography at Dartmouth College. He received his PhD in geography and an MS in both geography and water resource management from the University of Wisconsin. His research interests focus primarily on fluvial geomorphology and surface water hydrology with particular attention to stream channel and watershed responses to environmental change. Most of his research has concentrated on the hydroecological impacts of dams and of dam removal. His new project investigates the social dimensions of dam removal, focusing on dam removal as a lens into environmental <coughs> conflict. He has served on several National Science Foundation panels and was recently a co-author of a National Research Council report on the future research directions in the geographical sciences. His talk tonight, The Era of Big Dam Building, It Ain't Over Till It's Over, We'll explore the concept of the so-called large dam and assess our current era of big dam building on the international scale, particularly their biophysical, ecological, and social impacts. We are honored to have our two presenters here with us tonight, and I'm sure that their talks will delight and inspire you all. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming our first presenter, Mr. Cosgrove. drive down here, um, but I couldn't resist the invitation from Kat to come to join you, because you are so close, and normally I'm so far away and I don't get a chance to talk to my neighbors, so I wanted to do that. Uh, the opening remarks today already have well described the, the, the crisis that we are dealing with. And I'm going to just uh, present this uh, from another perspective. Um, I want to think about the Earth. The Earth, it provides the resources we need for our growth and development, the air, the water, the minerals, terrestrial and aquatic e ecosystems, the elements of which they're composed, they're the same as the day the earth was created. The, the water we have today is the same water we had then and it's more than enough for all of us if we manage it well. But they put together 
They compose a very fragile environment on the Earth's crust, as thin as the skin, outer skin of an onion is to an onion. It's estimated that all of this started about four and a half billion years ago with the, with the formation of the planet. Humans, it's less than, a, less than a million years since we have had humans. And in geologic terms, really, the human species has existed on this planet only for the past thousand years, as we know it. We learned pretty slowly at first how to manage the planet's resources to meet our needs, and create conditions for our development. The controlled use of fire started about 350,000 years ago. But the first wheel that archaeologists have found was probably made about 3,500 years ago. Our requirements for water, which was already spoken of, and in order to meet our higher living standards, to protect our ecosystems, makes water pretty special. But it, it was about 3,500 3, years ago, too, that we started to manage water by building weirs, diversions, dams and canals in Egypt, in China. Several canals were built about 600 BC to transport people, cargo, armies. The irrigation system in uh, in the Sichuan Basin was built about 2,300 years ago and continues to produce benefits in flood control, irrigation, water transport, and in general uh, for all water consumption. By 2,000 years ago, the Romans had mastered the fundamentals of managing water, including in many ways water quality. Not as sophisticated as we know today, but they were working at it and they were heating buildings, they had transportation systems, and they started to work on other issues of communications and governments. About uh, 1441, the world's first standardized ring gauge was invented and has been in use since then in Korea where it was invented. So it's only 600 years ago that we started to measure this quantity that's so important to our lives. But as we developed all of these tools, we made it increasingly possible to support people, to human life, and the human species multiplied. In the past 100 years, the world's human population has more than tripled and the world economy grew six times faster than the world population. For our survival and development, the basic needs of humans are for drinking water, for food, for shelter, for energy, for heating or cooling, and for jobs, for a source of income. All of this comes from water resources, energy resources, and ecosystem services. Water managers have made it possible to meet the needs of most of the seven billion people living on the planet today. Not so bad. About 89% of the world population has access to an improved source of drinking water. That's improved 7% during the 13 years since the Millennium Development Goals were set. About 85% are adequately nourished, although we haven't made little, any progress at all, uh, in fact, during the MDGs. But if we look at the situation from another perspective, about 2.5 billion people lack adequate sanitation. 35 million people die each year from water-related diseases. 2 billion suffer from lack of adequate sanitation, two and a half. Thirty-five, uh, two billion suffer from malnutrition. Three quarters of the world's wastewater flows 
into the environment without any treatment. A billion people have no electricity in their homes. Double that number don't have clean fuel for cooking. A billion live in absolute poverty. Indeed, despite economic and social development efforts, the gap between the rich and the poor is growing. Whoop, did I miss one? That's where I'm supposed to be. Sorry. <coughs> one of my favorite quotes about that growing gap. Meeting the needs of those without the benefits of water and of the estimated <coughs> 2 billion more to be added to the population by 2050, while at the same time our resources are increasingly strained, is getting to pose many problems. The problem grows in the future. As has already been said, it's commonly estimated that 70% more food will be required to eliminate hunger and feed a population of 9 billion. But the composition of agricultural production is also going to change. In North America, only 40% of agricultural land is directed to food production. In Africa, it's still 80%. That's going to change. And production will increase for animal <coughs> feed, for biofuels, for energy, for other sources, and for our rapidly expanding cities and industries. Yes, water is the bloodstream of the biosphere. It links society and nature. This slide uh, has a couple of things that I would like to point out. First, the congruence. This is from a paper by... Charlie Varus Marty in Nature in November of last year. You see the congruence between the areas that are red in, in the top slide and in the bottom slide. The top one is water scarcity, the bottom one is loss of biodiversity. That's one lesson to learn. The other is that in these areas that are colored red, there are today a billion people living who cannot, even if they manage their water well, they cannot feed themselves and meet their other needs. There isn't enough water there, and the populations are still growing. And it's because the populations are growing that there are going to be, if the present situation continues, two billion people living in that situation. But what does it mean? It means that they have to get the things they need to live from areas in the world <coughs> where there is enough water and suitable land to produce it for them. We humans are we're spreading all over the planet and we're changing and those of us who were lucky enough to be in the, in the show that uh, just preceded this one with the, the landscape pictures have seen it. We're changing the fundamental geophysical and biological systems of the planet. Whether we live in rural areas or cities, we manipulate vegetation together with the soil and the water to better meet our needs. We're changing the landscape, we're putting in contaminants. The impacts often exceed the impacts attributable to climate change. Part of the challenge is that taking actions to mitigate these changes takes time because society has to become aware of a problem before they begin to act on it. Important decisions affecting water management. And normally we think this is, this is the way we manage water. We've got resources, we've got uses, we've got reasons why we want to, to objectives we're trying to achieve and we manage it all there and we think the people who are managing that are managing water. We're not. The water is being managed to, to meet these changing conditions and these are the people who are deciding how we're going to manage water. People down here are just doing what we're told by the greater society we should do.
There are global crises in climate change, energy, food supplies and prices, troubled financial markets. They're all linked to each other and they're linked to water management. They arise against the background of continuing poverty for a large part of the world population. Unless they're resolved, they may lead to increasing political insecurity and conflict. We were in the water business. We've been aware of this for decades. But as I just said, we don't make the decisions on development objectives and on the allocation of human and financial resources. In a desirable future for humanity, all the people would have access, secure access, at all times to an adequate quantity and a price they can afford of safe and nutritious food, safe water to meet their household needs, clean energy for their heating and cooling, clean air, healthy housing and the surrounding environment. And these would have to be supported by a socioeconomic system that provides the people in return for their efforts with an adequate income to purchase the services. A large number of people on the planet have already achieved those goals, as I said before. In some cases, they've surpassed them, but in a rather unsustainable manner. Consider the progress that can be made. The MDGs have been mentioned a couple of times by the previous speaker as well. There was an MDG to reduce by half the number of people without access to safe drinking water by 2015. Safe drinking water is, is something that's difficult to define. And if you want to set a target, you have to define something. So the definition, the target was set to provide access to an improved source of drinking water. In the 20 years since 1990, 2 billion people have gained access to an improved source of drinking water. To me, that says that if we have an agreed, well-defined goal, it can be achieved with the will, the effort, and the funds. <coughs> Achieving a multiplicity of goals, though, when they compete for the same resource is going to be more difficult. Through a systematic approach, some avenues that could facilitate the task are being explored. And the project on which I'm leading now is one of those. We intend to if you remember that slide that had all the arrows showing how everything is linked to everything else. Well, we are going to build a system that will allow us to analyze that and to find solutions to the problems that will be sustainable under any future scenario. And thus, we'll be able to identify actions that can be taken now in all sectors that are positive and robust under any scenario. To conclude, I'm convinced that we can achieve the desirable future that I described. Maybe even by 2050. Scientific knowledge and technological development are expanding exponentially. Today, they're only limited by our imagination. For example, we can use new communications technology, not only to share knowledge and create a collective intelligence, but to determine our shared values and our objectives. We can determine a strategy to act on them and share it. <coughs> I think it's important that increasingly women, women and, and young people who bring a more nurturing perspective and concern for the future are making their voices heard and they're participating in the decision-making processes. I don't pretend that it will be easy. Humans have been trying to reach this objective <coughs> forever, but we don't have to create a tower of Babel. We can do better. 
we can look ahead to the future and find our paths. And with leadership and individual and collective responsibility, work together to build the world that we seek. It maybe it won't be in paradise, but my last remark, even if I thought the goal was unachievable, what else can I do but work to achieve it? Thank you. Um, so I want to do and thank Timmy and everyone here in Middlebury for uh, inviting me and also my uh, colleagues Chris Nedden and Colleen Fox for uh, uh, presenting today. And again, it's just a really uh, fascinating topic, first of all dealing with water, but also the ideas of uh, uh, identity and access uh, to water uh, as well. And so what I want to do is maybe switch gears a, a little bit and uh, really start thinking about uh, some of the infrastructure that we were just sort of talking about earlier and that uh, Timmy herself was alluding to in her uh, introductory remarks. And for those of you who know me know that I'm a devoted uh, baseball fan, but even more a devoted um, a Yankees fan. I'm willing to admit that. And uh, ouch. And, and so I had to, when, when in doubt, it's always good to have a Yogi Berraism, you know, up there. And so, uh, again, it was many years ago um, that um, the Secretary of Interior first declared the era of big damn building was over. That was in 1995. But hopefully, or sadly, what I'll talk about tonight is that uh, Yogi would once uh, say, opine, it ain't over uh, till it's over. And I want to present uh, some of the sort of the trends that are going on in terms of a dam construction, both within the United States, but also uh, internationally as well. So why is there such a tremendous concern then for uh, large dams, or I would say dams uh, of any size uh, as well? And so I'm concerned, there are many different reasons we could sort of uh, evaluate these uh, con concerns at the social level, the ecological uh, level. What I want to focus on today in my talk is more, uh, as I was alluded to earlier, most of my interests are really in the hydroecological impacts of uh, impoundment uh, and dams. Uh, and tomorrow, my colleagues uh, Chris Nedden and Colleen Fox, uh, in their younger years, this is a good picture of them, uh, we'll be presenting some of their work more on sort of the social dimensions and cultural dimensions. Uh, of dams, particularly in Southeast Asia and along uh, the Mekong uh, as well. Uh, so what I want to do, uh, so, just so initially to start then, is just thinking about sort of the broader uh, context uh, for dams and dam construction, both within the United States uh, but also uh, globally. It's just one of those issues, people again, when they think about dams, have very different ideas what actually constitutes the dams and very different styles, structures, and uses uh, of those dams, both domestically but also uh, internationally. And again, so looking at that, just looking at what's going on in terms of the construction of it, but also uh, look into the future and sort of think about what the future is of uh, dam construction. Again, uh, it ain't over uh, till it's over, and it might be over uh, in the United States in many ways, but at, in, throughout the rest of the world, in many ways, it's just uh, starting uh, now. Uh, how many dams are there in the United States? Oh, my goodness. A ringer over here, 75,000, 75,000 going once. 75, do I hear? Do I hear 80? How, how many dams are there? Okay. Why, why this picture? Okay, 80,000 dams, okay, in the United States. You think about this, essentially, we have been building, on average, one dam per day since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Just to give you some scale of the construction, I mean, you, you, that's some busy beavers out there building uh, dams. And in particular, again, one of the things that I'll be stressing in the talk is that these 80,000 dams or 75,000 dams are only those dams that are listed in the National Inventory of Dams, which is run by the, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And I'll show some data from some work that we've been compiling in New England that shows that uh, NID is uh, missing most of the dams uh, that exist certainly at the, at the regional level. So basically as a nation, we've been on uh, a real uh, burn to trying to uh, build uh, these dams. And we look at uh, ultimately the time series of this. This is some work that Martin Doyle uh, published in Science a few years ago. Again, sort of here looking at the, the time series of dams of various sizes, less than about 25 feet or so. Those dams are about 7.6 to 15 meters or so. And really one of the things we see is just a, a massive acceleration of especially large dam construction in about the 19, 
uh, 40s to about really to about the uh, 1970s or so, uh, when again and then, then when all the environmental legislation began to uh, emerge. So again, it was a very active uh, period uh, for us. And again, it's one of the things that Timmy has tried to stress within this conference. It very much also very much wraps around issues uh, of identity as well. I'll get to that in a second. We look at this in terms of the uh, reservoir, in terms of how much water is being stored behind some of these dams. This is the cumulative time series of water stored behind uh, all the reservoirs within the United States. Essentially, we're storing about two times the annual runoff of the Mississippi River uh, behind all of these reservoirs within the United States. And um, one of the things I, I, I love sort of telling a story, and I think it might be true, but you know, if you, if, I'll deny it if you, if you blame it on me, but it was a paper several years ago where physicists uh, actually did some of the math and tried to figure out that we've displaced so much water and placed it in particular places, particularly in the mid-latitudes, and all this tremendous volume and mass and weight of water that we've actually changed the rotational speed of the planet. Okay, just to give you some... I think it's true, but you can go on repeating it as if it's true, I could show you the paper. So uh, it's, it, a lot of people have been fighting over that one, but uh, again, just to give you some idea of sort of the global uh, scope uh, associated uh, with that. And again, as I mentioned that in terms of the sort of uh, identity uh, very much wrapped around this sort of uh, large dam construction, it very much goes back to many ways to, go to both uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, but also to FDR. In particular, Teddy uh, was the president who initiated the Bureau of Reclamation in, in 1902, whose uh, sole mission is to water the West. And this is very much wrapped around strong issues of national ideology. And part of that strong national ideology was very much ideas of Jeffersonian democracy uh, coming out of the sort of 1890s, all, uh, the corruption that was occurring, and trying to give sort of a, a square deal for the, for, the, for the little yeoman farmer. And so Teddy was very much active in terms of uh, inaugurating the Bureau of Reclamation and uh, getting it going. But it really was uh, his whatever second cousin or so, FDR, who really launched uh, a lot of the large dam construction. A lot of these were uh, built during the Bureau of Reclamation sort of early days within the 1930s and uh, 1950s. And uh, I'll put a little shout out. My colleague and friend Chris Den has a book coming out on some TVA and also some of the Bureau of Reclamation uh, and sort of the broad ideology uh, occurring at this time as well. So there are large dams uh, that also we see later on have very strong uh, ecological impacts as well. So when we think about all these dams that exist within uh, the United States, these 75 or 80,000 uh, dams, again, we sort of, you know, sort of imagination tends to sort of uh, uh, gravitate towards those Grand Coulee dams and the Glen Canyon dams and the like, and dams of that nature. But in fact, when we look at the sort of frequency of dams within the United States, the most of the dams that we see in the United States are actually located uh, along the eastern seaboard, uh, primarily within the mid middle Atlantic states, but also uh, throughout uh, New England as well. And again, there are multiple definitions uh, of dam characteristics that uh, make you eligible to be within the national inventory of dams. Sometimes it's just based on height. Other times it has some combination of height, but also storage associated uh, with that. So if we look at the data from the national inventory of dams and look at this at the regional level uh, within uh, New England, and here sort of basically within New England, we think according to their characteristics that there are about 4,200 uh, dams within the New England area, which about 200 of these might fall under the rubric of sort of large dams greater than about uh, 15 meters in height. And also sort of what also is happening to a lot of this sort of infrastructure, and it's been tremendous uh, effort thinking about this, is that a lot of this infrastructure is also aging. And so there's a tremendous concern then in terms of what are we going to be doing with some of these uh, large to small to medium-sized dams as they begin to uh, outlive their uh, lifespan. So we did this then also, what I've been doing is working with various state agencies and NGOs, in particular Nature Conservancy. What I've been doing is sort of collecting my own data on dam frequency within New England, and basically using no criteria other than is it a dam or not a dam. So it's a very simple binary uh, definition there, no height requirement, no reservoir capacity. Because in many ways, a lot of the dams that we see in New England are really running the river facilities that don't meet any of the requirements to be within the national inventory of dams. And when you do this, this number jumps from 4,200 dams in New England to 14,157 dams. So again, so if you think about New England, just think about a map of New England, what might that look like? It looks like this, okay? On 
average one dam per day. So, th this is, so if you think about these sorts of d dams, they've basically we've been building probably three dams per day since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And I've shown this, this map several times in some of our colleagues in Maine, and they think what's really underrepresented here is there's a lot more dams in Maine, but most of it is on private uh, logging area, and none of those dams are reported. And so we, have, we don't have access to those data, because we know there are a lot more dams probably within, uh, within uh, the Maine uh, area. It's a large state. We really we see a strong concentration of dams here in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and across uh, the industrial, former industrial site of the Industrial Revolution within southern New Hampshire. But also when we think about these dams, that all these dams come in all sort of sizes and uh, flavors. And uh, this is a um, view of uh, my town of Lebanon, as you all know, in New England. A beautiful day in late July here in, uh, in New England, and the little dam there to laugh at that, okay. Uh, it's sort of a nice little run of the river facility dam. We have some of these large dams, sort of Murphy and Comerford Dorm uh, Dam up on the headwaters of the Connecticut River. This is Wilder Dam, also for uh, hydropower uh, near, near Dartmouth. And I'll come back to this one later on within this talk. This is an old industrial dam that was built, we think, around 1780 or so, but a three-meter high crib dam, which will sort of figure prominently when I get to at the sort of end of the, uh, the talk um, later. But at the international level, again, one of the things within the United States, again, we have pretty good access to some of these data. That we think there are about 75 or 80,000 dams within the United States. But certainly one of the things, again, these data exclude uh, China. I'll come back to China in a second. Basically, we also see it's sort of the heyday of large dam construction at the international level that very much mimics the time series of what we were looking at in terms of what was going on within uh, the United States. And we break this down as well, this sort of this major period of large dam construction. We also see essentially this major period of acceleration of large dam construction, again, from the 1960s, 1980s, but primarily here within sort of the, the global north. And certainly one of the things that, certainly during this time period, that sort of the large dam construction uh, was sort of uh, present, but uh, not as robust as what we see throughout sort of the global north. And I'll come back to that in a little bit as well, because really this is, this is the game changer uh, for the future, this large dam construction within uh, the global south. When we look at this, then other sort of inventory of dams that exist at the international level, the International Commission on Large Dams uh, published these data a few years ago, uh, and according to their best estimates, and again, there are different size requirements, both in terms of height but also reservoir volume, but they uh, uh, calculate that there are about 47,000 large dams uh, internationally, and most of those are in China right now. And again, this is one of the areas also in terms of growth, in terms of large dam construction. We'll see it later on that China and Asia are really where the, the growth regions are for large dam uh, construction. Uh, this is a shot of the uh, Three Gorges Dam, uh, to give you some uh, idea. And then in terms of where the sort of the projected large dam construction uh, is going on, in fact, one of the things we see that already sort of under construction right now, that some of the leading countries and regions that we're sort of looking at right now, uh, that uh, India and, and China really sort of are sort of leading the edge, and this sort of might be the race to the bottom or race to the future, who knows, but in terms of sort of this large dam construction that primarily has tremendous amounts of activity uh, throughout these two countries, but also in uh, Turkey and, uh, and also in uh, South uh, Korea. And they're for very different purposes, flood control, irrigation, uh, hydropower. For many of these, they tend to be multiple purpose uh, uh, reservoirs. These are some data uh, that uh, uh, my colleague Chris Snedden uh, sh uh, showed to me. This uh, comes from a blog, and I always tell my students, don't ever go to a blog, but, but, but when it confirms what you think, you, you go right to that blog. And, um, <laughs> and so this is a, a map of uh, dams that have been uh, constructed or and maybe either proposed or under construction uh, throughout uh, uh, China and, and other parts of the Mekong in particular. And we're seeing just a tremendous amount of uh, large dam construction both currently planned, currently uh, uh, constructed now, but also being planned for the future. And so that's, a, a, again, sort of a real sort of regional hotspot uh, right now. And one of the other things I think is going on that's really interesting, especially uh, with China, again, at the international scale, uh, that one of the things we see is that uh, China has become a real large uh, international funder uh, of large dams uh, as well. And one of the things, again, it's a story of the New York Times from a few years ago that I, I was attracted to, Essentially now, when we oftentimes think about large dams, especially at the international scale, it has usually has something to do with aid or some modicum of social altruism. And one of the things we see, one of the game changers that's going on now is that China is building large dams, in particular in Brazil, 
uh, for resource extraction to bring back to China to fuel sort of industrial production. So it's a really different story that's going on right now at the international scale. It may have been going on even uh, back in the 60s to uh, 1980s or so with the U.S. World Bank funding uh, some of these. So we're really seeing some of these sort of new uh, political and economic uh, geographies beginning to emerge uh, and really sort of new spaces of industrial geography. There's a lot to be explored, those of you students out there, within the sort of regional shifts that are going on in uh, large dam constructions. Also, sort of uh, other regions, again, where large dams are, are being planned right now. This is in the um, uh, eastern flanks uh, of the Andes in Peru and Brazil and parts of Bolivia as well. Uh, what's shown in uh, purple is the sort of existing uh, dams and the circles are scaled to the size of the uh, megawatt production, but also tremendous amounts of planned uh, construction of these uh, large dams throughout uh, the Amazonian basin uh, writ large. This is a real sort of uh, hotspot area at the international scale. Uh, these are some data from the World Resources Institute, and again, trying to look uh, perhaps at the international scale, but also at the watershed scale. So uh, some of these might be grouped by several different countries. But one of the things that, again, sort of uh, one of the major areas where there's going to be large dam construction, it's really out there on the horizon right now, is what's going on in uh, South America. And uh, China is a very large uh, funder of some of these uh, projects, but also in particular Brazil, who have been championing uh, energy independence right now, and there's a tremendous amount of interest in by the Brazilian government in building large dams within uh, the Amazon basin. So again, my, my interest uh, is primarily within sort of hydrology, and again, I'll just give you some rough idea why we're so concerned about this sort of large dam construction. So most ecologists, when they think about what's the impact of large dams, break it down to these three general areas of fragmentation, connectivity, and uh, habitat uh, loss. So certainly within fragmentation, there's been sort of a tremendous concern in terms of basically how dams interrupt the downstream flux of uh, sediment and nutrients. But in particular, certainly within the Pacific Northwest, but also in New England, where we had long-standing migratory runs of Eastern Atlantic salmon, that basically these salmon, uh, these anadromous salmon runs have been um, certainly endangered, threatened, or for New England, most of the natural runs have been extirpated by uh, dams in all states except for Maine, in particular, the one of the few natural running rivers right now for salmon is the Penobscot Basin in uh, Maine. Why the concern? Again, sort of a busy diagram here. But here, looking at sort of years on this axis here, this is the month, and on this axis, looking here, the z-axis is uh, discharge. So here, this is the Green River in Utah below Flaming Gorge Dam, pre-dam, and this is what the stream hydrograph looks like post-dam. So there are several big concerns here. In particular, one of the key things that we see happening uh, whenever you put one of these large multipurpose reservoirs uh, in uh, a river, especially in this sort of semi-arid environment, you greatly reduce the flow variability. You're going to decrease generally the max flood. Again, these are oftentimes for flood control uh, purposes. The other thing that tends to happen, we tend to lose sight of, is that uh, besides increasing the extreme peak flow, there's also tremendous effects going on in terms of minimum flow. And a lot of these, especially if ecologically, a lot of species have evolved uh, for these particular cues for both max flows and minimum flows for sort of predator-prey relationships, spawning cues, and the like. So we're really seeing tremendous shifts in discharge, uh, but also, in particular, tremendous changes in the timing of flow. So this is, again, this is the tremendous ecological concern for some of these large multiple-purpose reservoirs. When we think about connectivity, this is a shot here of the uh, Mississippi River during the 93 uh, flood. And one of the things that uh, hydrologists talk about is the sense of connectivity. In other words, the way a river channel is connected to its broader floodplain and riparian zone. In particular, one of the things we see that's quite important is this sort of this flux of material uh, and geochemical fluxes from the channel out across the floodplain that are sort of fundamental for uh, ecosystem uh, functioning uh, and also some uh, species depending upon this. But also one of the things we're starting to pick up now is that there are tremendous fluxes in the other direction as well, in particular in dry land environments in Australia, that some of the major sources of uh, carbon, in particular DOC, coming back into the river systems is during these large floods that bring that DOC back into these uh, stream channels. We also see, again, these sort of large floods are sort of fundamental for uh, other uh, ecosystem surfaces uh, functions as well. This is um, the Lisbon Bends down on the Missouri River during the 93 uh, Mississippi and Missouri River flood. Uh, this is at the peak stage here, and here it is a, a few weeks later as the stage has fallen. So basically one of the things that we've seen here is about uh, three to five feet of deposition of sand, and that there are certain species that require fresh sand surfaces to propagate. So in particular, one of the things we see is that these large floods, floods are fundamental then in terms of maintaining a floodplain forest community structure, and the elimination of those by dams has had a tremendous ecological effect outside across the broader floodplain and uh, riparian zone. 
And again, if we think more globally now, again, what we tend to also lose sight of is that there's a tremendous amount of sediment trapping associated with these uh, dams as well. Uh, so this is some work also, uh, that was also referring to by Boris Marty, uh, sort of a, a great, uh, Savitsky and Boris Marty doing, doing the best at work in terms of the international scale of impacts of uh, humans on river systems. And here sort of looking at sort of the sort of the larger accumulation of trapping of sediment behind these reservoirs. And one of the things that they're coming up with is that, that these impact of the sort of international cumulative effect of all of these dams has basically reduced the flux of sediment uh, to the ocean by about four to five gigatons per year. So it's having a tremendous effect on the international, uh, international waters, but also in the international sediment flux and all the nutrients that are also associated with that uh, that now are being trapped uh, behind uh, these dams. Now, one of the social areas of this is if all that sediment's being trapped, what might be a potential social mechanism involved with this? What a social repercussion that be might be more regional or local? Coastal erosion, okay? And this is one of the things now that all the sediment's now being trapped. Essentially, the en marine e energy is, is stronger now than there's less sand available. And basically, it's gonna sort of um, cannibalize that sand from these beaches. And so, so really understudied area, it's really hard to sort of pinpoint that one, but there's a lot of estimates on coastal erosion associated with that. So I just want to end up in some of the work we've been uh, doing, uh, Chris, Colleen, and I, on sort of, uh, excuse me, on dam removal. Uh, and this is a shot, those of you who've been following this, this is the uh, Elwha River in the Olympic Peninsula in uh, Washington uh, a couple of years ago. And here it is now, and it's gone. And so one of the things now I asked you before is, how many dams are there in the United States? The next question is, how many dams have come out in the United States? I hear 10, 10, do I hear 10? Okay, one of the things we're seeing now is that basically uh, we've taken out at the national scale about uh, 1,000 dams right now. In fact, there's just a report in National Geographic today, American Rivers just released this, and that uh, in fact for, uh, there were uh, uh, another 60 or 70 dams taken out last year, and another 17 taken out in uh, New England. So again, we're sort of one of the main uh, regions in terms of uh, dam removal. When we look at the sort of time series of dam removal, this is an article that came out in Science a couple of years ago, uh, that basically at present right now, we seem to be taking out about 50 or 60 dams uh, per year. And the region then that's most proactive in this is in uh, the northeastern United States, in particular the two dominant states for dam removal are Pennsylvania and good old uh, Bucky Badger in uh, Wisconsin. And, but at the regional scale, uh, New England is becoming a major player in uh, dam uh, removal in particular what we're looking at now in terms of sort of the time series for uh, New England that we're basically taking out about 15 to 20 dams uh, per year uh, right uh, now. And just sort of, again, these, when we think about the dams that are coming out, it's not necessarily always these sort of large multiple purpose reservoirs like the Elwha, uh, but this is the West Swansea Dam on the Ashwela River near uh, Keene, uh, New Hampshire. It was built about 1785. Uh, it's an old wooden crib dam that's completely outlived uh, its function. Uh, the dam owner, a woman, a uh, family, she inherited from her family. Uh, this is their, their building. They wanted nothing to do with this dam, so they started the process of generating the removal of this dam. How long do you think it takes to remove a dam? This 200 and 32-year-old, three-and-a-half-meter-high wooden crib dam took 11 years to come out, okay? And this was not environmentalists chaining themselves to the dam to sort of remove this dam. This was the dam owner, okay? And so one of the things, again, in terms of what Timmy has organized here in terms of identity, that there's just tremendous amount of conflict and sort of cultural heritage that's played out in, in this dam removal process. And this is one of the things that Chris, Colleen, and I are hoping to uh, explore in the next uh, coming years. So in conclusion then, uh, I would just say that uh, at the sort of in both domestic and international scale, uh, dams are an ubiquitous uh, feature of this landscape with about 80,000 dams, it it's just an NID, but there's probably another 100,000 to several hundred thousand more dams that aren't in the National Inventory of Dams. Internationally, there's about 47,000 dams in the ICOL uh, data set. Uh, I would say, uh, in particular, in terms of the future of large dams, uh, in many ways it's been halted in the United States, or at least attenuating in many ways because of environmental legislation like Endangered Species Act and environmental, uh, National Environmental Policy Act. But things are really, I think, just taking off now in the global south. I would pay special close attention not only to Asia, but South America is really, I think, one of the prime areas right now for some of this large dam uh, construction. 
And so maybe we were the, we were the trendsetters as a country uh, in terms of uh, building large dams, and maybe now in terms of taking these dams out, we might be able to uh, be a trendsetter uh, in this as well. And I think what a lot of this then is sort of in conclusion sort of shows, and some of the things that Colleen and I were talking about in the drive up, is really sort of in terms of the identity, very much a the theme within the, this conference, is that it's very sort of multi-scalar. And so at the international scale, we see a country like China really trying to come on strong on the international scale, being a major player and trying to exert its influence in terms of large dam construction. Uh, at the regional scale, it's only one of the things uh, that we're seeing in places like you know, dam removal is really having a tremendous uh, impact as well. But also in terms of identity uh, for these places where dams are going in, that a lot of local uh, actors and regional scale uh, people uh, are, their livelihoods are being disrupted and, and, um, and being displaced by these large dams and that's some things Chris and Colleen talk about tomorrow. At the local scale, some of this resistance with uh, dam, con uh, dam removal is really sort of showing how people have an incredible attachment to some of these features in the landscape and the cultural heritage and identity to that feature is a pretty strong force and um, uh, tough to deal with. Thank you very much. I think that the mandatory joke about a uh, presentation involving uh, large water management features by someone who used Yogi Berra in the, in the title would be Damn Yankees. Oh. Had to do it, couldn't pass it up. I, I, I'm Mike Sherrod and I'm prone to bad jokes as you've probably already noticed. Um, I'm from the Sociology and Anthropology Department and I work on water management issues in Sub-Saharan Africa, mostly dealing with irrigation. Um, I'm not going to do too many comments, I just want to do one big framing comment on these two presentations. It seems that the 20th century was a time of local and national planning around water. With th that, 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 that's what drove what happened with water on our planet. And now, according to Bill's talk, we're looking toward a 21st century of global planning. And so far, I haven't seen many signs of the national and the local giving uh, uh, power, authority, legitimacy to the global. So I, I think the way water is probably going to go for the rest of our century is going to be uh, a struggle over local control, national control, and global control. Okay, now is the time when we turn to you to, for some comments, questions, and yeah. otherwise interaction. My role as moderator is to take your questions, organize them, and package them. So I'd like to take two questions that may be completely separate, maybe a little bit similar, and then I'll give them to our presenters and we'll see how it goes from there. You had your hand up already. Go ahead. Uh, I was interested in dam removal because it's the first time I hear about it, uh, so thank you for introducing us about the community. Um, I would like to know for the two dams that are being under construction in China and say, uh, South America, how long are those supposed to run and actually be efficient? And, and are people actually thinking right now what is going to happen in 100 years, 150 years when they're going to have to be taken down? Or is it something that is not, never actually talked about? The second question I have is, we talked about dam removal right now in the U.S., and to what extent, I mean, what are the difficulties in, in taking a completely small dam out? And just on a larger scale, um, is it even possible to remove a huge dam, or is it only possible once it's a China dam? One interruption. Uh, could our presenters come up here and, and be up here in front? Because well, we are filming, so if we could get our presenters here to give their comments, we're, we're our, our, our camera people will be very happy. Can I just follow up with that question that just didn't come to sure. the is what, what, what are the political drivers of the dam removal? Uh, obviously, we just got to talk a significant amount of money, and, and I was hoping with what groups are, are behind this project. Okay. So that was two. So uh, uh, I'll come back to you next. You want three? Well, you are in charge, so I can. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Two. So uh, our questions were uh, dam removal, and what was the first one? Both dams. So both about dam removal. Um, I would say, uh, in terms of uh, the small versus large dam, I think things like the uh, Elwha Dam uh, sort of signal that, in fact, some of these large dams are, are in fact, uh, coming out. Uh, and in fact, some of the work that we've been doing also in the Penobscot Basin, one of the largest dams in the Penobscot Basin came out uh, last year uh, as, as well. So it's not just these uh, small dams. In terms of sort of the, the difficulty of sort of removing them, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Brian Graber at American Rivers, one of the things he always likes to say is uh, taking a dam out is really easy. Convincing someone to take a dam out is, is, is really hard. And I think that's sort of the big issue right now. 
in sort of the broader politics then, and perhaps another way of framing it then is sort of the coalition building that sort of goes uh, along with it. And so you know, in, in many ways, um, it is some combination of top down uh, and bottom up in terms of uh, removing, uh, removing these dams. Um, in particular, what I'm more familiar with is a place like uh, New England, uh, that it, in particular, one of the, um, one of the things that we, am I allowed to show more slides to me? I'd have to, uh, yeah, but anyway, um, I won't show the, the map. But um, I, I, in terms of in terms of it, if it was a uh, regional scale top down ecological mandate for New England, one of the key things is returning migratory uh, salmon to these rivers. But in terms of where the dams have come out, they haven't come out in coastal areas. They've been sort of taken out, and most agencies would tell you this that it's come out on a very ad hoc basis. And what it's basis, and so what it's led to is sort of what we would just call sort of a, a landscape of strategic opportunism, right? And so. Basically what happens is one of the key things, the key drivers for this is liability. So uh, a, a dam uh, might be uh, about to fail and so there, and it also one of the reasons it varies by states is that not every state has a state agency dealing with dam removal or dam safety. Uh, sometimes it's FERC and sometimes it's not FERC, so it's federal level. Uh, so essentially through some uh, safety uh, evaluation, what will happen is someone will notice that there's something wrong with the dam. And to oftentimes to the cheapest option, more often than not, is to remove the dam. So economically, one of the key drivers is the cost is actually cheaper to take a dam out, especially these low-head uh, dams. The other one, not only is it uh, economically just outright cheaper, uh, there's more funding available for it. And so NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Agency, has funds available in New England to uh, subsidize the cost of dam removal. So if it's it generally has something to do with anadromous fish, basically um, and NOAA will subsidize it uh, to almost, uh, to almost to some instance up to 100%. So what happens is a town or a family or an individual is confronted with uh, a safety hazard. It's basically told it's going to cost them $600,000 to repair it or $500,000 to remove it and it will cost them nothing to remove it. They're going to opt probably for removing. And so I think that's probably what's going on. For some of these larger ones, the coalition building has very much been around a lot of these are hydropower, so it's getting the, the dam owners and the hydropower companies uh, to see the sort of economic cost that, in some instances, cheap, it's cheapest to take it out than to repair uh, the dam. Any more questions? Um, yeah, and I'd uh, like to pick that up, but also uh, the, the general question of infrastructure building. Uh, and, and, and also your question about global and, uh, and uh, local. Mm -hmm. There are, because it all fits together. And I, I, I want to tell you, I'd, I'd like to describe two scenarios to you. They're, they're, they're both extremes, in a sense. One is almost my, a dream, if you will, a vision that I tried to paint for you, that we are going to have nine billion people living on this planet. We're all going to have enough of everything. We're going to cooperate in order to get there. Okay, that's maybe it's an extreme, but um, if you could choose a normative, a norm that you wanted, I, I suspect we would all want that. The other one is uh, that if we continue as we're going, and I want to push that one to the extreme. So we have an elite group of people on this planet. We have saw it represented by that curve that I drew of the growing difference. The, 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 there are more people who are getting to have millions of dollars in their pocket and, and a lot more who are getting to have very little. And the extreme of that is that those who got this money realize that the planet has become inhabitable. We, we, we're destroying it. You produced evidence. Charlie's producing it more and more. I'm working with him right now. We're working on each other's projects. So uh, that's what we're doing. We are. We have a choice. We're going to. We are making this planet that we live on. We're de determining what it's going to be. And if we keep on going the way we've been going, we're destroying it. So, uh, but the elite are. are you know what they're going to do? I dream of, well, they build themselves a big platform in space, right? <laughs> yeah, they can raise it up there. And they go and live on the platform up in space, away from this destroyed Earth. Uh, 
they have everything they need up there for a very for healthy life, a happy life, I suppose. The resources they need are still down on the planet. Well, every once in a while they send a team down, like in Star Wars, and they mine whatever they want, ship it back up to their platform, and fight off the savages who are still who have managed to survive down there. And that's the other extreme. So what we've got to do is figure out what do we want to do with this planet? How, how are we going to feed and clothe and provide meaningful lives for 6.9 billion people? And will the planet have the same shape physically as it has had? Will it be different? And you know, keeping in mind that we share this planet with other species, what's it going to be like? What do we want? You may say he's a dreamer, but he's not the only one. Cat, uh, <laughs> question to you, Thanks, and then John. we have a question back here. So I'm going to stop doing the two questions thing and just go one by one because I think <laughs> this is what you want. Sure, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> well, you, you answered the question. Um, and uh, I find it it's interesting because I think um, I'm not sure who always decides who's getting research funding these days, but I'm, s I'm working with one group in Canada and I'm headed next week down to NSF on the hearings on proposals for international funding for research in water. And you know, uh, there are two characteristics that they have in common. And they both deal with exactly what we're talking about. One is that uh, they have to involve researchers across disciplines, of course. We started doing that, whatever, 10 years ago but now internationally, so that we're sharing experiences across cultures. And uh, the second one is, it has to be research that combines physical science and social science. And the social science, the real question that we've got to figure out is the governance one. How are we going to organize ourselves in order to take the decisions that we have to take? And we don't know very much about that. It's the, it is igno it's the part that's ignored. The physical side, we know, I think, enough to tell what's going to happen. We can go, we don't know a lot of things yet about the interface between water and land and the, sp the many species on the planet. And yes, we can do more research there, but that's not the key. What we need to know on the physical side, I think we know. What we don't know is how to motivate people to work together and, and how to find the solutions together. That's, that's our problem. Uh, and we're going to try to do the same thing, too, in our, in our work to, do, to try to identify solutions. And so we've, we've got social scientists involved in our project as well. But we're not the only ones. I, I'm really... Uh, very happy to see that, there, that there's some that w awareness has developed. Yes, Pete. Um, yesterday on VPR, Jane Lindholm was interviewing an economist from the Wilderness Society, and she was talking about the feasibility of uh, uh, renewable energy for Vermont. She talked about solar potential, wind, and she talked about hydro. And I wonder, in the era where we might be moving towards dam removal, she said if Vermont wanted to generate uh, a quarter of its energy supply from hydro, we need to build 1,200 more micro hydro facilities dispersed across uh, the state. Whether or not that was feasible was a question, but I'm curious about the ecological impacts 
of these small scale hydro projects uh, in a region whose cultural identity is connected to kind of an environmental ethic and, and might be motivated to move in that direction. Um, that's why I collaborate, because as we were driving here, Colleen said, did you hear the story on VPR yesterday about the <laughs> small head hydro? And I was like, okay, so, um, I mean, I, I think, I'm not going to go into all to the details, but there's, it, it comes up a lot in terms of dam removal, just about retrofitting, and a lot of it also, one of the concerns is, who's going to pay for that? That's, that's, that's the first concern, whereas dam removal, no and other companies and uh, agencies are, are part of that. The other one I always like to try to stress, and not the only one, is that um, there's, a, there's a tremendous difference between uh, renewable, clean, and green. And um, hydropower might be uh, renewable, but it's not necessarily green. And so I think hopefully one of the things that came through today is sort of all the ecological concerns. If you think about uh, biodiversity, if they talk about uh, in-channel habitat, riparian habitat, um, uh, global habitat, and some of the sort of trapping of sediment, uh, migratory fish species, uh, that whether it's a, a low head a hydro or uh, the Hoover Dam on these rivers in, in Vermont to a fish species, it's the same thing. And so, uh, it's, so from an ecological standpoint, I, it's not no, and that's the thinks about it as necessarily as, re, as clean or green. The other issue sort of being played out at the global scale is um, that the greenhouse gas emissions associated with some of these subtropical and tropical reservoirs is huge right now. And so whatever is sort of offset in terms of energy production for uh, hydropower is offset by uh, how much methane is released into the atmosphere. And it's pretty much, again, it's a highly controversial topic right now, uh, but people, if you want to include all sources of energy and all th impacts on, on the environment, and you start thinking about GHGs and large subtropical reservoirs, uh, the jury is still out how, how productive and how uh, green the hydropower plants are. Chris, you want to? Come on up, guys. Vermont may be thinking of building micropower plants. The Quebec government decided last week that they're going to kill all their micropower plant uh, program. Um, there was a very practical reason. The per kilowatt cost of, the, of that small power is actually quite high. And so they're, they're buying, they're producing the power, but they're selling it at a loss. Uh, and there are uh, the costs that are associated. But again, I want you to think about the future. Did you ever think of a satellite capturing solar energy, beaming it down to Earth as a solution? Have you read about that happening anywhere? Well, I can tell you that Mitsubishi in Japan have a project by 2000, 2017, they will have a functioning pilot plant. They're planning to have a, a uh, 20 megawatt pi pilot plant in operation by the middle of the, of the 2020s and a 400 megawatt plant that will be in, uh, in commercial operation by 2027. Now, if, you, if we're doing that, and if this is commercially possible and the price is low enough, we solve a lot of problems because together with the energy problem, we're going to solve the water problem. Because we, if, you've got, if, you can, if you've got energy that's that cheap, you can desalinate the, the ocean as much as you want or any other source. So we need to start thinking about the world is going to change. I, talk, I mentioned the change in technology. Technology is changing, and it's changing on that same curve as population. It's like this. And so, it, you know, we need to think again, what kind of a planet do we want to live on? And we have to start thinking about it in terms of, of today and 20 years from now, because it's changing so fast that we've got to think that far ahead. It takes us that long to make the changes in the way we're doing things. So we have to be thinking about where, what, it's, what are we going to have on this planet 20 years from now? And start thinking about it now and acting to, so that we'll have some control over that. I, I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, I saw two hands. Okay, two more questions, if they're fast. And then we're, we're going to give the, the, the presenters two minutes each for summing up, wrapping up, 
final reflections. That's the schedule. So uh, you, you're first, and then you're second. Um, my question for Mr. Castro. I'm, I'm very interested in scenarios and scenario planning. Um, what are you doing about who the audience for the future water scenarios are? So maybe you have. Probably preaching the converted in many cases and instances in this room. Uh, but I found governments and particularly politicians, this is the classic you know, result uh, of many years of study of environmental policy, not by me, but many other people, that the time frame of government politicians is extremely short relative to the time frame of significant environmental change. Um, so, how do you communicate the scenario? Well, before they even accept the result or possibility of the scenario, how do you get governments to buy into the scenario planning process in the first place? And I think in some of the research that's shown where that's been successful is actually including them in the scenario, developing the scenario. So I wonder if that's sort of like the <coughs> purview of the ASA project and the other work that you're working on. Um, yes, you, you got it exactly right. Um, we've, we've been working on this project now uh, for, for about three years and we presented uh, preliminary ideas where we were going at the World Water Forum in March of 2012, so about a year ago. Uh, there was a, f a full day with um, uh, people looking at uh, water and food in the future, water in the city in the future, water and energy in the future, you know, as usual, all separated out one by one. And then our project, which was trying to show how they, they really are competing for the same resource uh, and some scenarios of what could happen. And we presented that to a panel that was composed of uh, people who are either politicians or senior advisors to politicians. And they... Um, I have to tell you, we were going to pre we were at that point talking about scenarios about the future, and they said, "Yeah, we should think about the future. Uh, we agree with you. That's a useful thing you're doing, but that's not what politicians want, for exactly the reason you said. And they don't want. They want to know what can I do today that will be a good decision." in the future. What, what can I do today that's, that's going to be sustainable and won't prove to have been a wrong decision? And we ch we've changed the project and we've added that element to it, which I referred to in my talk. So what we're trying to do is to get, uh, we're doing two things, um, but to finish on that, that, we're asking people, what are solutions that you think might work and we're going to test them to see whether, in fact, if we put them into our system, whether what result it would take, in the, what it would give in the future. But more than that, we're going back and we're starting with those scenarios over again, and we're bringing together a group of people who are advisors to decision makers. We may not be able to... Uh, get the actual politicians to come and sit at the table, although I've had some former politicians who are willing to do that, to come and sit at the table, and maybe we can find some again. But at the moment, we're focusing on senior advisors in different countries to get them. And we're looking at four classes of countries. For me, it's a two-by-two two grid, rich and poor, water-rich and dollar-rich and you split that four ways. So you can have a rich country that's also rich in water. They basically, they just have to sell everything they got and make more money, right? The, but you, if you take uh, a rich country that's water poor, I used to say, well, they can buy their way up. And maybe ultimately they do. But when I said that to someone from Qatar, uh, his answer was, you're wrong. Our, we can't, it's not so easy as you think. Just because we've got money doesn't mean we can feed ourselves. The, two years ago, we had one country that supplies us with water, with food, 
that had floods. We had another that was having a drought. And we had another where there was a major forest fire. And between the three of them, it's not that the price went up. It, there wasn't enough food being produced in the markets that normally supply us. We have bought uh, land and effectively the water that goes with it in Africa. We don't like that because the country where we've got it may decide one day they they're not going to take it away from us. So that's not secure. And they don't like it either because they don't like us there taking the, the jobs and their food away from them. So we may have the money, but there are all kinds of problems still out there. And you, you can look at the other two. If, you, if, you've got, if you're poor and you've got lots of water, you've got lots of, potentially lots of water, but what infrastructure do you build so you can use that water, and who's going to pay for it? So um, we've got to get those people sitting there and talking about the scenarios of the future, and that's what we're going to do. Jeff, you've got the last question. Oh, it looks like we're out of time. <laughs> Woo, that last question. <laughs> <laughs> say probably the, uh, the key word uh, that sort of uh, links this all is efficiency. Uh, and certainly one of the things that we see is that a lot of these uh, structures are, are built, uh, and as you say, they were built for purpose. Sometimes that purpose was political more than it was hydrological. Uh, and so in many ways, and trying to think of allocation of resources uh, is fundamental. So, uh, and when we think about efficiency, there's tremendous amounts, and Bill showed some of these diagrams um, in terms of the amount of water that's used for irrigation. And uh, the return flows are oftentimes quite low for, for irrigation. And in fact, water isn't used, we might think, efficiently uh, in, in one way, but another way efficiently might also be economics as well. And so uh, we also see tremendous amounts of water that's wasted, in particular uh, in the western United States, where essentially it's being heavily subsidized by the Bureau of Reclamation. And so when the true cost of water, both social cost and economic cost, are revealed, I think you'll see, might, you might see some of this realignment. I agree completely with what, with what you have said, and I would add to it that um, as part of that efficiency, I don't think we do a good... I mean, we have to store water. We've got problems of too much and too little. Uh, we need to find some way of, of preventing both of those from happening. We need to take the, make the water accessible, but there are lots of ways of doing it, and I... The way I look at large dams is they should be the last, the last uh, resort because the, the problems they create become mega problems. But if we start with thinking about the rainwater, Qatar is sponsoring uh, a worldwide uh, movement to look at dry land farming. If we can get more food from dry land by p managing it better, that's going to solve part of the food problem. We need to look at, uh, at leaving more water in our in the fresh water in the freshwater ecosystems, and taking advantage of the services that they that they provide. We need to think more about whether we can 
change the, the nature of our of our farming. Um, you know, for for our biofuels, why don't we grow algae in in brackish water and harvest that and use it to to burn to create create fuel if that's what we want to do. There, there are a whole bunch of things that we can do. Maybe there will be a time that the only solution or the most efficient or the solution will be to build a large dam. But then we've, we've learned a lot about what we've done wrong in building dams and maybe we can figure, do a, a better job of building them in the future. And there's always this question of what's, what's happening now. The, the, all of the infrastructure we've built that's more than 100 years old is falling apart. Do we need to build this, the same infrastructure that we built before? Let's think about new ways of, of building for the future. And we're not doing that. We need more innovation in, in thinking about how we manage this water, which is essential, but in ways that, that are going to leave us with a planet that's, that we all agree is going to be someplace we want to live. Okay, so thank you, everybody. So in terms of time management, just checking, uh, would either of you like to make a further final statement, or have you both said your piece? I, I rest with my final statement. You rest your case. Yeah. Rest your case, okay. Okay. Do you want to say something? No, we, we have a two-minute wrap-up. If, okay. if, if you wish, yes. Okay. It's yours to take, if you okay. want. So um, since I was thinking about it, um, I was looking at my, my own slides, I'm looking for some uh, clues, cues to sort of help me along with my uh, two minutes. And I would say, um, in terms of sort of pulling it all together as I look into the, the future, the, the crystal ball here, that sort of the two words that come to mind are really the, the same words in a way, which is opacity and transparency. And so when I think of this in terms of what is happening in the United States, is that enormous amount of dam construction went on when the process was incredibly opaque. And no one had really any idea what was going on, whether it was the Corps of Engineers, the Bureau of Reclamation. It was very much top-down, uh, camouflage decision-making. Because of things like Endangered Species Act and NEPA, things became progressively more transparent. More stakeholders uh, had uh, standing and had rights, were able to get involved with the process, which I think is a huge part of the, uh, the coalition building, but also the, the process of, as Bill says, thinking about what the future uh, might look like. I think for a lot of things that are going on in sort of the global south right now and the large dams that are under construction or planned, I think it's because that process, again, is not very transparent. Uh, and I think one of the things that we're starting to see, someone asked about uh, sort of international efforts, is that uh, when people find out what's going on, uh, you get a lot of grassroots organization going on. And it's only when the information is made available do you begin to get that critical coalition building. And so uh, for me, it's, uh, the, the future and the past is very much wrapped around this issue of transparency and opacity. Well, I decided I okay, go ahead. Second. Okay, you can do it. Um, I, w I, I do want to say that it w hasn't been only just a question of lack of transparency, but uh, as I, I told you, I guess I told you, my first training was as an engineer, and I have worked on uh, designed dams, and while I was at the World Bank, I was responsible for arranging by bank financing for construction of dams. Um, maybe, probably, no, processes weren't expected in those days to be transparent. It's the way, it's the way it was. Uh, we know now that, that that should change, but there's more than that. We didn't know a lot of things. And I made mis I, I did things which I know today have turned out to be the wrong thing. But I didn't do them knowing that, that, that I was doing something wrong. I didn't know better. We didn't know what was happening with climate change, for example. Uh, so one of the dams uh, that was financed by the bank on which I worked doesn't produce any power anymore. It's in a poor country. They. Fortunately, it was a very poor country, so their debt has been forgiven. But if it hadn't been, they would have had to repay the loan that they had taken to build the dam. And now, because of climate change, they don't have the flow there that, that justified the building of the dam in the first place. So the transparency, we know now it's needed, but we also, uh, have, we also are learning all the time. And sometimes 
uh, young people say, well, you know, how did, why did you do this? You know, that was the wrong thing to do. Yeah, it was. And I hate to tell you this, <laughs> young people, but you're going to discover 20 years from now that something you're doing today was wrong. <laughs> Thanks. So please join me in thanking Bill and Frank for getting us off to such a good start.